something that is constantly on top of my guest list today on the podcast with me is Dr. Saliha Afridi, a clinical psychologist, a mental health advocate, and the founder of Lighthouse Arabia, the leading mental health and wellness clinic in the UAE. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Saliha. Thank you for having me, Tahida. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a huge fan of yours. I watch all your videos and I love reading your articles every month uh, on Harper's Bazaar. It's almost, you know, every month it's, it's like, you know, those articles are reaching out to me and talking to me. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. It's, you know, there's a lot of heart and mind and soul that sort of goes into writing those. Um, it's not just something that I flippantly write. And so it's really nice to hear that they resonate with you. Because I can see that you have, you put in a lot of your experiences and, you know, what you're, what you've been through in those articles. And probably that is why it connects so well with the people who are reading it. Yeah, thank yeah, so you. So before yes. we delve into all of that, like, you know, why don't you briefly take us through who is Dr. Saliha? What you started out doing, in fact, that's very interesting. That's different to what you've achieved today. Oh, I don't know if there's a short way to answer that question. No, I have time. Um, but but, to, um, but to, to briefly say, um, so yes, I am a clinical psychologist and the managing director of the Lighthouse Arabia, which is what I am today. But um, in my past lives, I've also um, had my, you know, I did my undergraduate degree in cultural anthropology and uh, journalism slash communications. And I was all set out to um, do a job in marketing, actually. And I, my first job out of college was with a marketing firm. Um, and then I, you know, one day, all of a sudden, as it happens with most of my decisions, they happen all of a sudden, um, I realized that I couldn't be doing marketing for the rest of my life. It just wasn't, I loved the human psychology behind it, but the, the end goal was not aligned with what I wanted to be doing with my life. And so um, I shifted gears. I even considered going and doing dentistry. Um, but then when I was doing courses for dentistry, I realized that that also was not. But because I really like to see people, I like to hear people's stories. I like to hear them talk. And as a dentist, you don't get to do that very much. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, and I always really, you know, question the dentist that is asking me questions while they're like in my mouth. So no, that definitely wasn't going to be doing uh, something that I wanted to do. And then eventually I came to a crossroads in my life where I really didn't know what I was going to be doing with it. Um, but my sister, my older sister asked me a question and she said, what do you love? And I said, I love stories. And I've always loved stories ever since a little kid, like it was, I could lose myself in books and everything that you see behind me here are books that I have read and lost myself in. Um, and, um, and I said, I love stories and I love really being with people, like helping them and caring for them. And she said, you should be a psychologist. And, um, and so that kind of was my journey into psychology. And I've said to people that the day I feel done with this job is the day I will be done with it. So it's not like I don't follow my heart's calling or my soul's calling. Um, I go where the soul takes me and it took me to psychology and that's where I am. And I was in the US and I moved to the UAE 14 years ago and that's where I have been, or 13 years ago, going on 14. Um, and I started the lighthouse 10 years ago. So um, that's kind of been my journey in my professional world. And all the while, I've been a mother of four children and um, a daughter, a sister, a friend, um, and the wife. And so that's kind of who I am in a nutshell and how I got here. Oh, that's interesting. I like the part you said, you know, you started out doing marketing, you didn't find your calling there. You even almost went into dentistry. And then you finally found your calling in psychology. And I also like the fact that people have to an open ended, you know, journey, yeah. where you're not going to restrict yourself to just being a psychologist, you're always open to experiment more. Yes, I'm, I'm going to go wherever there is energy 
in me. I'm not a person that can get easily motivated. I actually didn't do very well in um, my, my elementary school years and my high school because it requires a lot of motivation. Mm-hmm. Um, I did well. I was a good student. I was a hard worker, but I could, you know, one, I really shone most when I entered college, when I could pick my own courses, where I could pick my own learning. And I went and I learned everything there was to learn about everything. It took me, I, took, I think I stayed in college an extra, one, a year and a half extra to the point where my father had to call me and say, I think you should graduate. You have enough credits <laughs> now. And I'm like, oh, okay, fine. And so I will, um, I will go where the energy is, where the inspiration is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's usually what I have done up till now. Yeah. So, I mean, like, why did you choose to move to UAE after having done your psychology? Did, like, you know, didn't you think there was more options uh, in the U.S.? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because at that point when I moved here, it was not a, a, it was a field not even in its infancy. Yes. There was very little known about it. I think there were just a handful of psychologists in the UAE at the time. Right. Um, and so, you know, uh, it was a decision I wanted, I wanted to be in this region. Mm-hmm. I have always felt, you know, I've traveled to the region, I've come to Saudi, I've come to the UAE, um, even in my anthropology courses, when I would read about places like Yemen and Syria, like, you know, Lebanon, I mean, these places really evoked something inside of me, which it felt like um, a recognition rather than um, a a learning about. And so there was something about this place that I recognized. What most people don't know is that the first, you know, first three years of my life were actually spent in the UAE. My Uh father was placed here. So my mom actually lived here. My mom and dad actually lived here. My mom flew to Pakistan to deliver Um, and to have me to be around her family and then she flew back to the UAE because Mm -hmm. this is where their home was so in some way from Pakistan my yes my background is from Pakistan Mm -hmm. Um, my family is from Pakistan and you know my 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 bloodline is from Pakistan Um, and uh, and yeah and so um, so in in some ways I my spirit could be from this region Mm -hmm. and that's where I feel most at home. And so um, the the first chance I sort of got to come here and to serve the region Mm -hmm. and to uh, educate the region when it comes to just mental health awareness, to raise awareness in this sphere, Mm -hmm. I I took it. um, And that's when I moved to the UAE. It makes sense. Well, probably you would also have had the first mover advantage, you know, moving to the UAE at that point in time, because there is still, you know, no matter how far we've come, you know, there is still a stigma around mental health. Yes, of course there is. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's very loud and clear, Mm -hmm. the stigma. There's a lot more awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say because of COVID, um, some of that awareness has just become like common, you know, everybody's talking about it, Mm -hmm. but it's easy to talk about it when we're talking about mental health awareness, but it's hard to say that I'm going to see a therapist. Yes, exactly. Yeah. the shame and the stigma to say that I'm going and I'm meeting with a psychologist right now. Mm-hmm. That's the stuff that most people are not, um, okay. not yet. Not yet okay to share. So you, uh, Saleha, like, you know, when I was reading about you, I saw in, like where you've spoken about how you were at, at the stage in life where you were working so hard to prove that you could do it all. You know, you were burning candles at both ends uh, to a point that you were challenging the patriarchal society and not your family. You've always said that your family has been very supportive. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I, I grew up, you know, my first seven years of my life, I would also the first three years were in the UAE, but um, the, you know, after that I was in Pakistan till I was about seven years old mm-hmm. or about, I had just turned eight when we moved to the U S um, and, and, you know, that, that culture, um, coming from, you know, quite a patriarchal culture, although I would say that these biases exist around the world. And that is a yeah. fact, a researched fact that, you know, gender bias exists everywhere, but in patriarchal societies and some traditional societies, it's more present than before, mm-hmm. uh, a bit more present than in other places, I would say. Yeah. 
Um, and so when, you know, I having kind of, um, you know, internalize the idea that men are better than women and when men can have more than women and men can seek education and men can go out and work because I come from a family that's quite traditional where women weren't working and, you know, we got married when we were young and that's kind of how we did things. Um, although my father and my mother have always been about educating us and, you know, we went to the US so my, we could further our education, mm -hmm. um, but it just felt like, um, it was not something that I had internalized necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I really did sort of set out on a life mission to say that I will do whatever a man can do. Mm -hmm. And I, and then I will be, I will show the world mm -hmm. that I can be just as good as a man. Or even and that was kind of really my agenda that I will show you that I can be just as good as a man. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I literally lived my life with this kind of mindset that I am just as good as a man. I am just as good as a man. Then just treat me as equally, speak to me as equally, see me as competent as you do a man. Um, however, what happened was that I, you know, I, I, I really ignored my body. I ignored my heart. I ignored my emotions. I did things that in patriarchy, men are also held accountable to, which is you don't, you know, you don't tend to your physical body, you don't tend to your emotions, you boys don't cry, uh, boys are tough, mm -hmm. um, boys provide. And so I held myself to those, that criteria as well. And what that did was that it eliminated a part of me that um, that actually is a very integral part of who I am. Um, until I began my healing journey, I would say at about in my early 30s, when um, when one day one of my uncles actually said that you know um, Saliha is like a more man than any man I know, mm -hmm. and and in that moment I felt really validated that I did it. I showed everybody that I could be just as good as a man, but I realized. In that moment, I heard a voice that said, but you're not a man, you're a woman. Yeah. And a, a, a sadness overcame me, which made me realize I had denied a whole part of me that I, you know, that I wasn't listening to, I wasn't, you know, caring for, I wasn't giving a voice to. And that's when my healing journey began. And that is not to say that I don't have the masculine side of me still that I, you know, access, but I'm no longer denying the feminine in me. Mm -hmm. And the goal for me is to be a more whole person, mm -hmm. move towards wholeness rather than being one dimensional, either being too feminine or too masculine. This is where I think we become one dimensional mm -hmm. and lopsided, mm -hmm. um, but giving voice to all parts of us is what we need to be. Um, and, and I realized that when I started to step more and more into my full power, rather than comparing myself to men, mm -hmm. um, by the way, which no man had ever asked me to do. So let's just, I, mean, I want the record to be straight that it was not that men were competing with me. I was just trying so to prove myself. Yes. Yeah, um, but, um, but yeah, but I think if men leaned in to their feminine and women leaned into their feminine and men leaned into their masculine and women leaned into their masculine, I think we would move towards wholeness mm -hmm. and, and, and operate from all the parts of us rather than these constricted, restricted roles that patriarchal society sort of define us with, which is usually leaning towards the parts of us that are uh, more easily accessible. So for women, their feminine might be something that they can, they're more inclined to, but that doesn't mean they don't have a masculine. And for men, it doesn't mean that they don't have a feminine. It's just that patriarchal societies usually, you know, pigeonhole us and they say, well, this is what you're good at because you're a woman. And this is what you're good at because you're a man. And those roles can be quite restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I, you know, that's what I realized in my healing journey is how do I step into my full power? Mm -hmm. So when, when you were going through all of this, you said, I think it was the late thirties, you act, this realization actually struck you. Early thirties. Early thirties. Yeah. So, but yeah. weren't you like doing a psychology it. by then? Were you doing a psychology by then? Didn't you feel oh, there was yeah. a gap somewhere in between, you know, that you were stretching out, you were burning, burning yourself out? You know, that's one, um, 
that's one myth that I would really like to dispel is that, you know, therapists have it all figured out. They don't. Therapists are human beings and we have a lot of theoretical understanding. And I've been in therapy personally my whole life, uh, when it comes, well, my whole professional life. Mm-hmm. Um, and on and off, I've engaged with therapy. And, you know, with the most recent one being, you know, I started with a therapist five years ago in, in analysis. And that's something that I've been working on since then. But to say that I would know everything there is to know about everything would not be human. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still uncovering. I'm still healing. I'm still working on. And, um, but I do believe that therapists have a duty and an obligation to do a lot of work on themselves Mm -hmm. um, because we cannot take people where we ourselves have not been. Mm -hmm. If there are parts in me that I have not uncovered or healed or processed or digested, there's going to be less of an ability for me to be able to do that with my clients. So I see it as a professional duty and obligation for me to do continued work. Mm -hmm. also for the fact that like when you see a lot of your patients they come to you with their traumas and their troubles so like because and that could also overwhelm you you know on top of what you are going through yeah and you also Um, I think for a lot of us and how do you de-stress like you know probably after listening to someone you know so much so much that you have to take in for them them as well you know this was something I um I remember when I first started in my doctoral program it was very hard for me. You know, my mom, when I was young, she said, be whatever you want to be. Just don't be a psychiatrist or a psychologist. She did tell you that before you even started out uh, on this journey. Yeah, but that was like a, when I was just, you know, maybe 12 years old or something, because her father was a psychiatrist. Oh, wow. And so, um, and, and, you know, and he was a very sort of renowned psych- psychiatrist at the time. And I think he had given some similar advice to my mom that you shouldn't be a psychologist or you shouldn't be a psychiatrist because you're too sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, And she gave me that advice because I was too sensitive. And I think, um, and she is right. When I first started my, my program, I remember just wanting to rescue people, wanting to heal people. And I was very young at that time. But I had a supervisor who told me that um, do not underestimate the strength of your clients. Uh, Do not underestimate the strength of the kids that you work with because they are enduring, they're living through what you are trying to rescue them. So they are survivors. And so don't think you are better than them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm just trying to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And he actually really put things in perspective for me that we cannot help anyone and we should not. It is not my job to help people. Mm -hmm. It is my job to support them as they help themselves. And so that really gave me a lot of perspective that I am there as a support, Mm -hmm. but they are the survivor they are the ones who have the most amount of insight into their information. My job is to just be a facilitator and a supporter. Mm-hmm. And when I sit with my clients, that's what I see myself as. I am their companion. That changes but they perspective. Are um, and you don't carry as much then. Mm-hmm. I will help you. Um, I will assist you in carrying that load. But in the end, this is your life and your story. Mm -hmm. And I am there as a witness. I'm there as a companion. I'm there as a supporter, a facilitator. But having said all of that, there are days that I am absolutely overwhelmed by a story of my clients. There are times where I have cried with my clients. There are times where I have gone and I have felt finished by the end of the day. And that's when a lot of my self-care kicks in Mm -hmm. and I know that I have to really do a lot of self-care in order to show up the next day for my clients as well as for my children Mm -hmm. so if you are a therapist or a psychologist or a mother or a father you have a duty not just a recommendation but a duty and an obligation to take care of yourself because you are no good to anyone Mm -hmm. if you are depleted Mm -hmm. and that's something that we really 
encourage a lot at the lighthouse, uh, but I also really live by whether it's in my personal life or in my professional life. Mm -hmm. So how do you de-stress? Like, how do you take care of yourself? Because you always talk about self-love. You always, you know, pro you, you are a huge advocate for self-love and prioritizing yourself. So what, uh, what are your pointers for absolute self-love? So absolute self-love is different from self-care, mm -hmm. which is de-stressing and things like that. So mm -hmm. self-care is basically meeting your needs. Self-love is far more overarching, which is accepting yourself as you are. Yeah. So I will talk about self-love later if you'd like, but when it comes to self-care, I have a very strict regimen that I follow, whether it's, you know, exercise, whether it's about eating right, hydrating, mm -hmm. sleeping is a very big priority of mine, mm -hmm. um, making sure that I get my seven and a half, eight hours of sleep, making sure that I am, um, you know, um, doing things that I enjoy doing like horse riding, but also biohacking type of stuff, which is doing these IV drips or cryo sessions or LED beds. These are things that I've built in to my regimen, weekly regimen. I would also say things like uh, doing my own therapy and getting support for myself is a big part of me making sure that I empty out my container mm -hmm. to make room for other people, that I make sense of things so I can ha have space for other people's issues in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, a big component of my self-care as well. So, mm -hmm. um, but it's a very, um, you know, daily routine, mm -hmm. a meditation, breath work, exercise, sleep, all of that is part of my day to day routine. Mm -hmm. So I never wait for things to get bad before I take care of myself. It is an ongoing maintenance that I'm doing. So I never reach a place of burnout because I have reached that place of burnout yeah. um, twice in my life. And it's been very, very uh, difficult to recover from burnout. Um, and I don't want to get to that place again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about burnout, like, and, you know, having been through all that you said, like, you know, trying to prove a point to the society, trying to make your mark, you know, the kids today, the generation today, that the youth today, they are in constant competition, right? Like with all the exposure, too much information, there is so much that they have to achieve, you know, they are under constant peer pressure. So what do you think, like, what, you know, about the kids today, the kind of you know, pressure that they are under? What would, like having been through that kind of pressure and like you said, you've had this burnout, what would your advice be to the youth today? Because, you know, they're always exposed to so much. I would say my, you know, I have three teenagers, so I can tell you what I tell them. And I would say to the young adults in their 20s is really, um, although all the forces are against you, when it comes to sitting with yourself, knowing yourself, knowing your likes, knowing your dislikes, knowing what turns you on, knowing what turns you off, like knowing yourself is going to be the biggest gift that you can give to yourself, but also a superpower that's going to help you navigate the future. What I see in children and young adults and the youth, I would say today, is that they have very little knowledge about who they are. Mm -hmm. They are inundated with messaging because growing up, you and I might have had certain kind of messaging, but we didn't have a smartphone that was feeding us information literally, you know, every waking hour mm -hmm. of our day. We exactly. had spaces in between where we were wondering about who we are, what we are, how we do things, what we want to do. But now it's really about, well, what's going to make me a lot of money? What's going to get me a lot of fame? What's going to be liked by other people? What's going to be um, popular? Mm -hmm. Like these Trending. are the driving forces and what's trending. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that it cannot be how you live your life. Yes. Your life must be lived from the inside out. And that will make you a little bit strange and weird mm -hmm. to other people around you. Yeah. That might not make you, not might not give you the competitive edge mm -hmm. in the early parts of your life, but it will give you an edge as you get older because you will be the person who is connected to their inner voice mm -hmm. and their truth. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, 
is going to be the thing that's going to guide you as you enter your 20s and your 30s. It's not going to be, if you go with what the popular thing is, you're going to keep swinging left and right because what pop what is popular keeps changing and that's going to be very exhausting way to live your life um and i do see people that burn out that really lose themselves they don't know who they are mm -hmm. and they say i have everything i have money i have all the things that money can buy I'm not happy but i don't know who i am and i am not happy and so if the end goal truly is to be happy then it must start from the inside out. Mm -hmm. So is that an advice you would give to the current generation? Like, you know, because as a parent myself, you know, I'm kind of lost with the kind of messaging and the kind of apps that the kids have at their hand today. I'm also like, you know, just so troubled with the kind of, you know, because all of all our kids, they have their own devices, they have their own space and, you know, they're just so involved in into that. They don't really, they're not really looking forward to the future. They're just living in the moment, in the present. So what would your advice I, be like, you know, for, to like to help us parents, you know, to nurture well-rounded content, you know, absolutely content, confident individuals. I would tell the parents, manage the tech involvement of your children. There is um, educational technology, yeah. which is the laptops and things they have to work on. But the smartphone is not something you should give uh, without boundaries, rules mm -hmm. and restrictions. Yeah. My children, they're three teenagers, they don't have social media. My, um, my daughter and my kids just this year, um, they got a smartphone. Um, and before that, I mean, she's 16 years old and she got her first phone oh, and wow. she's not allowed to take it to school mm -hmm. and she's not allowed to take it into her room. Mm -hmm. I have a charging station, which is a fully equipped charging station outside of my room mm -hmm. where the children plug their phones in at night okay. or as soon as they get home, the phone sort of goes there. They can check their WhatsApp there. They can check whatever there, but I have the passwords. They charge outside of my room. If they don't charge it outside of my room then it's taken away from them for two weeks like this wow. is just kind of how yeah. we do things but I believe I think those that boundaries that's so important yeah and and they are not allowed to use it in the car when they're with me they're not allowed to use it at the dinner table they're not allowed to use it um you know when we're watching a movie together there are certain rules and restrictions and if they don't follow that it is not a right that they have. They have a right to education. They have a right to healthy food. They have a right to, um, you know, certain things in their childhood, but having a smartphone is not their right. It is a privilege. And if they don't yeah. know how to manage that privilege, then it will be taken away until they learn. And it's, I'm very sort of matter of fact about it. And I've educated my children a lot about the dangers of some of these things. So they know that I'm not being dictatorial. Mm -hmm. I am just preserving their brains. Um, and, and I'm really concerned about that because it is highly addictive and highly dangerous mm -hmm. for children, yeah. their self-esteem, their self-worth to be engaging with these things early mm -hmm. on in their life. Yeah, which is why I think in one of your articles, I read that you rather take the preventive uh, approach rather than the treatment approach to a lot of these issues, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. I know because I like how you set boundaries because there are a lot of conflicts. You know, we have so much peer pressure. The kids do have the peer pressure. Their friends have it. Their parents let them. So I think it's a collective effort of all the parents as well to be on the same page. Yeah. I don't know. I can't tell parents what to do. I can exactly. only tell my kids what to do. But my kids, you know, of course, they want to have access to their friends and they want to have access. My job is to educate them on the dangers of that's what they can do. Devices. Yeah, you know, and I have to live what I preach. Mm -hmm. If my phone is in my face all day long, and I'm telling them it's bad for you. Okay, it's not going to work. If I'm sitting working on my phone when I'm supposed to be eating dinner with them, if I'm not living the life that I'm telling them to live, the children will do as I do not as I say. And so I really live by these things. I really mm. want to be with my children when I'm with them. And when I'm working, I'm working. And when I am on social media, I'm on social media, but I'm not trying to do all of these things at the same time. That's where the danger is. And so living by example, but also educating your children. My youngest is seven years old. And when I tell her that I need, I want you to read and I want you to, I want you to do maths. I want you to draw. I want you to do puzzles because I'm concerned about your brain 
brain and I want you to have the best brain possible. Because if you watch TV or if you have a phone or if you do these iPad apps, um, it's not good for your brain. She understands it. So, and my children, I have four of them. So it's not like, oh, I had an easy kid. Mm -hmm. Four out of four are listening to what I'm having to say because I say yes to a lot of things to my children. But when I say no, It is a really sound no. And what I mean by that, it is an evidence-based no. Mm -hmm. If the evidence proves me otherwise, it's yours. But if the evidence proves to me that social media apps are absolutely dangerous to self-esteem and self-worth, then I'm not going to give it to you. And the facts are there. The whistleblowers are coming out of all sorts of organizations. Mm -hmm. The heads of these organizations are saying, we don't let our children touch this stuff. So why would I let my children do that? But it's just that these, these, I would just say to parents, educate yourself before you hand over something like this, before you give into peer pressure, because there is an addiction that you are forming. And if it was just an addiction, I would be not as worried as it is a brainwashing of values of messaging that these kids are getting, that to me is very, very concerning. And if parents are not aware of that, then I would say, make yourself aware, please. Mm -hmm. And be worried, be very worried about your Mm -hmm. children. That, that's good sound advice. And I like how you said you give your kids evidence-based uh, assessment. No. That's interesting. Yeah. That's and I tell them, convince me otherwise. Mm-hmm. Find the research that will convince me otherwise, and I'll give it to you. Yeah. But they can't. Okay. Maybe that's a tactic I should be implementing at home. So you also, you were just saying like, you know, you are encouraging the youth of today to have a conversation with themselves because nobody does that now. And, you know, there have been a few articles of yours where you've uh, expressed the importance of having that conversation. So, you know, being today, like, you know, using social media, like I do, it's so difficult for me to sit still and think about, you know, like dig deep and have these conversations with myself because our mind is so cluttered. We're thinking about what to do next, where to go next, you know, the different deadlines we have to meet. So how do you start having those conversations, those deep conversations with yourself? The first thing I would say is first to sit still. Don't have conversations with yourself. The first thing you have to do is still yourself long enough to hear what's coming up for you. And so meditation is a must have. It's not a nice to have. Focusing Mm -hmm. on your breath for five minutes multiple times a day is a must have. It's not a nice to have. That doesn't mean that the voices will not be there and it will not be noisy in your head. The voices will be there and you will hear it and then you will bring it back to the breath and then you will hear it and then you will bring it back to the breath. So it is like a brain gym that you are engaging in. Mm -hmm. And what that will do is it will help you differentiate from the voices in your head to the voices in your heart or your gut. Okay, and there is a different voice there. And once you start to build a different the the muscle between differentiating between the voices in your head and the voices in your heart, you can engage with the voices in your heart, but you've got to make space in your day. So if I end this meeting and I don't have another meeting for 10 minutes, I'm not going to immediately go in and start writing emails. I'm going to take 10 minutes because there should be periods in your day where you take 10 minutes to do nothing, to look out the window, to have a cup of tea, where you're not on some device or another. When you're at the red light, make space to just take some deep breaths, to check in, how am I doing? Am I worried? How's my body feeling? Like that's how you do, how you start to make space for yourself. Make space, have stillness, have quietness, and then, Think about building a relationship with yourself. If you're always on the go, 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 Mm -hmm. there is no space to have a relationship. Just like if you were trying to build a relationship and you're running alongside me, if we don't stop and sit down, we'll never be able to talk to each other. If we just keep running, 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 how deep is that relationship going to be? Sure, we have each other's company, but it's not going to be a deep relationship. First, you've got to still and make space. And that is very hard to do in today's world when all of us are addicted to one device or another. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's so profound. You know, I can actually see myself, you know, like, like you said, I'm just running from one thing to another. So I was recently talking to uh, someone and, you know, she was someone who wanted to start therapy, but she was not able to identify like, you know, like I, a lot of people go through that 
stage where they don't know if they really need help in their lives and they're struggling to find that uh, you know support they know there's something happening with them but they're still in the denial you know that i need help and i need therapy and one of the first things that uh, you know when she finally got to therapy she found hard was uh, the first thing that apparently at therapy that happens is they tell you to dig deep and confront your past and she said it was so difficult for her to do that and that she had to discontinue therapy yeah so um, what is, well depending on who you see as a therapist um if the person is showing up and they're really struggling, you're not going to go immediately into their past. For someone to go into their past, they need to be feeling strong enough to be able to go there. Yeah. But if they're not feeling strong enough, then a therapist probably shouldn't be taking them there at the at the get go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a lot of, you know, there are some theoretical orientations, some therapists that operate from a very past orientation. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, if you're seeing a clinical psychologist or a counseling psychologist, and someone comes to me, for example, and says, I'm really struggling, I'm really suffering, I, I don't know I'm, what's wrong with me, we're going to move into a very problem solution focused mm -hmm. kind of space. Let's figure out what's going on. Let's figure out what you need to work on. Let's figure out, you know, so maybe naming some of those things. And the first thing would be to help us re help her reduce the symptoms that mm -hmm. she's experiencing right now. So where is the overwhelm coming from? Is it because she's stressed out at work? Is it because she's stressed out with parenting? Is it because she's having difficulty with her partner? What is going on here? And we're going to work on that. Yeah, address eventually, the issue on the outset. Yeah, address the presenting issue. Mm -hmm. And eventually, when they feel like they've stabilized, mm -hmm. we might be able to say, listen, this presenting issue has played out once before with your mm -hmm. sister, and then once before with your friend, and another time. Like, wh when was the first time it showed up for you? And that might take her back into connecting something from the past. Yes. But you never go to the past without yeah. making sure you have one foot in the present. Yeah. Um, because that that can be very daunting. Mm -hmm. You say, oh my God, I have to go yeah. back and do all of that. Like, I just want to figure out my t life on a Wednesday morning. What do you mean I have to go back and figure out what happened to me when I was nine? Um, so also it takes I would time to that. probably build a relationship with a the therapist, you know, to go so yeah. back in time and you know actually connect with all of that all of the problems that you had buried down it's it's also it's about the relationship but it also is about the strength of the client mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. always are as a therapist looking at does this person have the space does this person have the ability does this person have the internal resources to be able to do that kind of work because it's heavy work. So if I don't sense that this person can go into the deep end mm -hmm. and go deep sea diving, I'm going to stay on the shore, very close to the shore. And we're just going to get through what we need to get through right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to take you into the deep end. Um, and so as a therapist, I mean, if a therapist is listening and if they take people right away to the deep end, I would really encourage them to maybe assess the person's internal resources and their strengths mm -hmm. to be able to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And I think also for the clients that are listening, mm -hmm. I would say, tell your therapist, I don't have it in me to do that. Not Can yet. we just focus on my life today? Yes. Can I just focus on my life today and do the other work later? Mm -hmm. And the therapist might say, sure, that work is linked, but let's do some problem solving. Or they might say that, listen, that's just not how I work. So let me refer you to someone who does work like that. Makes sense. So uh, what are the a few fl red flags that, you know, that as a psychologist, you would understand, like when one is actually, you know, and should be going for therapy? A few red flags that you can see in people like you know or some uh someone like me could identify in myself if i you know if there was something that i was trying to not accept if you think if the question has come up for you like maybe i should see someone mm -hmm. that's when that's the flag 
there's, there's, you, don't need, you don't need you don't need to have any other flags i this is where i think we look for too many flags and we dismiss the most important flag which is i need support mm -hmm. period that's it that's all you need Mm -hmm. that you don't need any other permission you don't need a problem that's bigger than that you don't need your life falling apart or you getting a divorce or you having a death in your family or 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 you just need to feel that you need you need to know that you need support and that is permission enough for you to just go and get help or support I should say mm -hmm. um I think too many people say to themselves well it's not that big of a deal I should yes. be able to do it on my own Mm -hmm. No, sometimes it's the small, 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 small things mm -hmm. that add up. And they, it's an additive experience of stress that breaks us. It's not a big thing. Yeah. So if I look at all yeah. the small things in my life, it just feels like really small things, not enough for me to see a therapist. But if I feel how I'm feeling, it's I'm feeling overwhelmed. That's enough for you to say I need support. And I need help thinking clearly. Mm -hmm. I need to know, um, I need to have an objective point of view on why this keeps happening to me again and again in my life. That's what a therapist is yeah. supposed to do. Yeah, and not probably reach till you, you know, reach that break, uh, burnout point. Breaking point, because mm -hmm. if you reach breaking point, it's a whole lot harder to recover. Okay. Just like if you wait till the tooth really decays, then, you know, and you're going to need a root canal or you're going to need a implant. It's just better to go get the cleaning mm -hmm. and make it, brush your teeth every day or, and floss every day. Why are you waiting till things really get to the end? Mm -hmm. And then the procedure is going to be a whole lot more painful yeah. than if you were to just do the maintenance part. Mm -hmm. um, which is why I also found it very curious, you know, very interesting when you said, you know, you focus on preventive therapy rather than treatment therapy. It is something that was a new terminology, you know, that I came across when I was researching on you. And it sounded well, very interesting. I, I would just uh, maybe tweak that a little bit by saying, I want to do preventative work rather than treatment focused mm -hmm. work. Preventative work is self-educating, self-care, um, looking at the mind-body holistically, uh, doing the yoga as well as the therapy. Like for me, it's really about preventative work. Mm -hmm. So it's not just therapy. Okay. It's all the things I do mm. for preventative care rather than treatment only. Mm. I'm all about treatment. I wouldn't be a clinical psychologist if I wasn't, but we are too focused on treating mental illness and not preventing mental illness or mental health difficulties, whichever way you want to look at it. We are too focused on treating marital problems rather than focusing on how do you have a healthy marriage? Like it's too problem focused mm -hmm. rather than how do we make sure we don't get to that place? And that does require ongoing investment of time, energy, money, effort, you know, space in your head. Um, but we're too dismissive of it all the time. And then we wait till it's breaking point. Yeah. And then we go to the therapist saying, fix me. And if the therapist, you know, it's one yeah. hour, how can, they, how can they do everything in an hour? So it's not realistic. Yeah. Oh, I love how you put it. And I, and, and I love how you say that a lot of these problems could be, you know, cured before it gets to that breaking point. Oh. Yeah. So before we leave, you know, I would, you know, you said that you would, you know, share us a few self-love tips and I would love to hear from you, you know, what they are and like how we can, you know, always take care of ourselves rather than, you know, just go for help in the last moment. So self-care, um, self -love. which is different Yeah, self-love. Yeah. Um, I already talked to you about my self-care routine, mm -hmm. um, but I would say think about it as daily emotional hygiene, just like you do dental hygiene and you brush your teeth and floss your teeth twice a day. I want you to think about what is it that you're doing for your mental health and your wellness every single day. Do not wait for self-care Sunday or self-love, you know, Wednesday or whatever else people do. The hashtags. Do yeah, exactly. Do it every single day. Where are where is the space for you? What are you doing for you? And that is a component of self-love. Just like if I were to love my children, 
One way I show them love is by sitting and listening to them. Another way I show them love is making sure that they exercise every day. Another way I show them love is making sure they eat healthy food every day. It's not just always, oh, you know, kuchiku, I love you. Some things are really disciplined love as well. And so I would say ways to love yourself are how you show up for yourself. Mm -hmm. But also love is much bigger than that. Love is about how you are with yourself, how you view yourself, how you accept yourself, how you show up and protect yourself. That's love, you know, in that kind of uh, compassionate, um, ongoing for good or for bad, for better or for worse, I am here for you. And you cannot love anyone or anything until you truly know it or understand it. For me to show up in a new job and say, oh, I love my job. No, that's just a uh, an infatuation that I might have. Mm -hmm. You really know what love is when you go through difficult periods. And so I would say for self-love is you really know your capacity for self-love when you know the parts of you that you feel quite ashamed about, mm -hmm. or you feel quite, you don't want to show anyone or you don't want to have anyone see those parts. And you show those parts love too. And you say, I see you. I love you. And no, you don't get to operate from that part. And I can see that you're jealous. I can see that you're envious right now of your friend. Um, and I want you to give your friend some love. And I want you to give your friend some blessings. But I see that you're feeling envious right now. And it's okay. It's a very normal experience to feel that way. If you engage with yourself the way you would engage with a child, that's self-love. You know, we don't usually do that. When I, when someone feels jealous or when someone feels envious, oh my God, they have so much shame that yeah. they, they're, they're, you, no that. you don't want to voice that out. You don't want to voice You look that in the out. mirror and say this to yourself or you just talk to yourself, you close your eyes and meditate kind of. There are times where I, I say to myself and, and do mirror work when I really need to make a point, like, listen, everything is going to be okay. You are safe. You are well, everything's going to be fine. Like sometimes I have to say that in the mirror. Um, but most of the time it's when I feel that part of me kick on, which is the inner critic or the perfectionist mm -hmm. or the part that's very hard on myself. That's the part that I meet with love and say, listen, I know you mean well, I know you're just trying to make me a better person, but I need you to be kind. I need you to speak to me kindly, say it kindly. And then that inner critic starts to speak in a kind voice. And then there's only love. So self-love is much bigger than self-care. Self-care yeah. is a component mm. of love. Just like your care for your family is a component of love, mm -hmm. but there's many things that are involved in loving a, another person mm -hmm. or another thing. And that's where you would need to figure out what are the things that you are doing to mm -hmm. show up for yourself. But love in the end for me means acceptance. I accept you just the way you are. Wow. And when you accept yourself just the way you are, it's a very healing experience. Mm -hmm. And then it's a very strange experience because then the best part of you shows up. Mm -hmm. Then the, the part of you that is wounded or hurt or defensive isn't so loud in you because you accept yourself. That's a beautiful reaffirming statement you can wake up and you know say to yourself every morning. Yeah, Thank you so healthy. much, Dr. Saleha. You know, it's, it was amazing talking to you. I, you know, I am I'm pretty, I'm sure a lot of your followers and our listeners can take so much, so much away from this uh, recording. And thank you so much. And I wish you so much success in all that you do and all the love and courage you instill in so many of your followers every day. I mean, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.